I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump I back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample-tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 193. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Frankenweenie, this Friday, the 5th of October, mm -hmm. we will be discussing Winona Ryder. Yes. That's a lot of... A lot of, a lot of uh, up and down on those syllables. Yes, yes. Um, a lot of uh, alternating between vowels and consonants. Winona Ryder is kind of... What are the quintessential people of the late 80s, mm, early 90s? Yes. Her career has kind of sort of dipped a little bit since then, but yes. there was a period where she was biggest star in yeah. Hollywood. I mean, she was huge. And with good cause. Yeah. And for us, I felt like the most natural place to begin was with Beetlejuice. Yes. I mean, she had done Lucas before this, which was a great film in and of itself. But Beetlejuice was sort of the first time I became aware of her. I mean, I didn't see Lucas until I was like 20 or something. Yeah. I, feel, so, I feel like it's appropriate with Frank and Weenie to bookend her career yes, with another Tim Burton. Tim, Tim that's Burton great. Good. Not that's like good her too. career is over in yes. any way, but <laughs> Craig currently... pronounces it dead as of now. <laughs> Frank and Weenie, last movie. Sorry, White Nona. Yep. Should have stopped at stealing. <laughs> You had to keep going, didn't had you? Had to go there. Had to go there. I too soon. Too soon. Too um, soon. The, so I should wait like no ten minutes. And yeah, I can exactly. Bring it up? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Beetlejuice is arguably one of the most unique. Tim Burton movies. I mean, this is the story of a the ghost with the most. Mm -hmm, the as, ghostest with the mostest. Is exactly. Right, who um, <laughs> essentially helps a dead couple try and scare out the new residents of their house. Yes. And it's funny because I remember mostly growing up with the cartoon. Uh -huh. Like, I don't know if I even mm -hmm. saw the movie before I saw the cartoon. I might have seen the cartoon before I saw the movie. I think I saw the movie before, but maybe not in its entirety because I might have been young enough that yeah, it's, I mean, parts I was of it scared me. six when this came um, out. So. so, But I do remember seeing Beetlejuice being an early part of my memory, and I do remember that being why I fell into the cartoon. And I, I, I'll tell you why I think I might have seen the cartoon first is because when I think, and this is probably true a lot, people i think beetlejuice i think lydia and beetlejuice yes. is sort of the main yes. crux of the movie whereas yeah. the movie is actually yes. about Ad, or, uh, alec baldwin and gina davis's mm -hmm. characters who are killed in an accident yeah, like a car accident a car accident yeah. and they're trying to adjust to becoming ghosts essentially yes. you know scaring the people in their house because yeah, i think of, it was like their newlywed house or something yes and, they just and they're trying itself. to bond with you yeah. know they end up bonding with lydia mm -hmm. and having to deal with this crazy ghost named beetlejuice and played by awesomely by michael keaton yes and this is uh not only what got tim burn the option to make batman, batman. but also definitely helped Yes. Michael Keaton get the role of Batman. Which, which is weird. I mean, I, I try not to, when I look up factoids for these movies, I try not to just be like, this person was supposed to star in it. But mm. this one kind of jumped out at me, especially because for me, Michael Keaton seems so perfect in that role. Yeah, it's hard to imagine anyone else. That it's hard to imagine. And clearly, after, uh, as both of us w grew up watching the cartoon, it's a stereotype of Michael Keaton's representation. So mm. you see it even more so. Sure. So the simple idea that Tim Burton's original desire for Beetle, for Beetle, the role of Beetlejuice was Sammy Davis Jr., who is his, a favorite star of his since childhood. But the studio executives didn't like that idea at all. Are wow, we surprised? That, no. That would be a very different I know. Movie. Isn't, that's, that's why normally I'm like, oh yeah, Brad Pitt instead of whatever, but who cares? But like, that's... that's I'm kind of glad the studio stepped in. I think that's strange by era anyway just the fact of sammy davis jr I'd, in yeah. 1988 trying to i, like, I can't I imagine what they were thinking when they yeah. put that suggestion well, together. I, I i don't think anyone he's put no that suggestion Quentin together Tarantino. except for tim burton yeah he's kooky he's yeah. kooky he's an <laughs> artist um gotta give it a credit though one uh the academy award for best makeup oh i think oh yeah that's deserved. like one of the best parts of the movie yeah. so all the different crazy deaths and dead people and weird shrunken heads yeah. and Beetle all the stuff that, that alec baldwin and gene davis do to themselves or yeah michael keaton for that matter yeah yeah so very 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 good start mm -hmm. i would say for my understanding beetlejuice, of beetlejuice 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 god damn it why'd you have to do that now we're now now we might as well just leave <laughs> yeah. that's pretty good actually thank you Moving forward, she kind of exploded like a rocket ship mm -hmm. in 1988 because that same year was the release of Heathers, yes. who, which also starred one of the other sort of counterparts of that late 80s, early 90s superstars, which was 
Christian, Christian Slater. Slater. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's it's a really really dark. Oh comedy. yeah. It's essentially about you know a couple high schoolers who end up murdering a group of popular girls who all happen yes. to have the name Heather just mm-hmm. because yes. they're. They're a clique, yeah, basically. and they don't like them, yeah, and it's just kind of ruining their lives, yeah. and so kill a kill some high school students and frame that all their deaths as suicides. Yeah, I mean that's the thing that's like even more uh, dark than most <laughs> movies. Like mo- there are movies where they'll like kill, you know, yeah, people. where people kill people, and like, I think Drop Dead Gorgeous was one yes, of them, definitely. Um, but this one, like, they go to the the extra length of making <laughs> it look like suicide, yeah. which is really, I mean. <sighs> writing suicide notes, making people think entirely different things about them after their death. Oh, it's one of those things it's that, you know... It's not bad enough you kill someone, but then you got to defame them after their death. Well, That's... not only that, but, you know, it, suicide is one of those things that it's really... It's really kind of tough for me to laugh about. I mean, uh, if you know... If you've ever known somebody, like, I... I have. I've, I've had friends, I've or a friend, friend mm-hmm. um, who commits suicide. And it's, you know, I'm not going to be, like, that guy who's like, you can't laugh at anything. Because, I mean, I think, you know, laughter is a way of coping. <laughs> but it's just, it's such a dark idea that it's kind of amazing that a film like this was able to get made and ended up being so popular. I know. I mean, I'm it, not saying that means it's bad or good. It's just, it's just surprising. Yeah, it, and and it had, it, it's, it went through a bunch of weird transformations. Like it had a much more bizarre ending, which is amazing if you think about how the movie actually really? ended. It had an ending with like, when a writer blows up the herself and the entire school after killing Christian Slater, and there's an entire extra scene in heaven with Whoa. the dead people dancing. There was a, it was. I mean, <laughs> I think they very carefully and cleverly, either in their way they edited it or what they chose, where they chose to stop it. Yeah, I would agree. Went right up to that line. Cause there's about four or five times in that movie where they hover really, really close to that line of like. This is just too much. Yeah. Like not too Toy. much dark, but I can't even take it seriously as a comedy. You're, yeah, like, you're pushed it, too it far. Gets, it's gets kind of and it gets wacky. right there, and I think that's one of the reasons why people love it so much. Well, I it think it crossed that line. I think the fact that they kept it somewhat wacky though yes. is also what sort of tempered that dark yes. tone of it, because it otherwise would have been like um, pretty dark. Yeah, and and most a lot of the movie also it goes all quite a ways in the movie with. Even when dark things have happened, trying to make it seem like just a really dark comedy. Yeah, totally. And it take it waits till almost the final act to actually drive home anything really. The f- the funny thing for me was I didn't realize how independent this film was. Mm, when I it was didn't recently. know was it. it- Played at Sundance. Wow. Nominated for Grand Jury Prize. It won the Independent Spirit Award for Best First Feature for uh, Michael Lehman. Wow. Um, Winona Ryder was nominated for the Indie Spirit Award for Best Female Lead. Wow. Something you think about. Uh, In addition to that, the director, Michael Lehman, um, is an amazingly, like, one of those sort of classic Hollywood guys that no matter... um, good or bad reception to his films he just continues to work to prove you know gotcha. once you're sort of in hollywood you can sustain a career i mean he did hudson hawk yeah Bruce everyone film, hates it but i love it uh he did airheads which i love i also but love a lot airheads. of people hate uh he did the truth about cats and dogs okay he did my giant the um george mirison billy crystal movie oh yeah yeah he did 40 days and 40 nights the josh Ooh. hartnett movie he did because i said so he did uh, lots of tv stuff so sort of the quintessential hollywood director wow. that just fills in whatever gap and just and just working continue just working, powerhouse just working so i th- i think it's an interesting postscript uh considering a movie that's so dark about people dying that um in the beginning of the film the chandler asks heather duke did you have a brain tumor for breakfast and the actress who played heather chandler kim walker ended up dying of a brain tumor later on wow not like close after like the next year but relatively close she died really close after the movie was made by a brain brain tumor that's that's either and one of the other ones one of the i think uh psychic two jocks that was supposed to die um killed himself with a shotgun in like 2000 or something well so. way to bring the mood down oh there's plenty of weird bringing the mood down with it with my trivia list for today uh it's all about death how about how about this tra- <laughs> transition in addition to michael lehman uh winning best first feature uh the producer denise de novi was also part of that award Mm-hmm. Who happened to also be a producer on Edward Scissorhands? Uh-huh. Boom. Yes, which, which came out what two years later? Two Damn. years later, Tim Just Burton right directing back again. It. You know, I was thinking about this when we put this together. Depending on which day you ask me, this might <laughs> like be my fame. Precursor. 
That's Might good. be my favorite Tim Burton movie. I think it's probably his overall best. I mean, in I, my opinion, there. I mean, I like Batman a lot. You know, um, Beetlejuice. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a lot of one. I mean, Big Fish. There's a lot yes. of ones that I could really, really think about liking a lot. Um, but if you ask me on a certain day, I might say this is my favorite one. I think it's his most creative. Yeah, if I, you ask me, I think it's I, got his best mix of all of his different talents. creativity, mm -hmm. uh, heart, yes, um, style, yes, definitely uh, the weird gothic, like macabre sense. Which is, I mean, what, I mean, the story is obviously about a guy who was. <laughs> Uh, I don't Somewhat know. Created, what, maybe? Yeah, he, he was he was created formed? by it. He was formed, <laughs> and then his um, creator dies yes. before he's able to complete him. He's left with these scissor hands. Yes. He's sort of left up in this castle. Eventually, one day he comes out, and he sort of has to interact with the real world. Yes. Some of it's wacky, some of it's <laughs> tragic, and some of it is downright appropriate. Like when he stabs, <laughs> yeah. um, what's his name? Um, Anthony Michael Hall. Yes. Like, yes. I, I don't totally think anybody was, was upset about that, frankly. I mean, it, it's crazy to think of Anthony Michael Hall as, like, the badass guy. guy. <laughs> like, sort of like the 80s nerd. And this is also blonde Winona Ryder, which is, mm, trippy. I think, the first, I don't know if it's first or only time she did that, but definitely weird. Going along with that Tim Burton style, he likes to have the dark hero and the pure colored uh, heroine, I guess. I mean, it's, it, I, d I definitely think, you know, in the early days, you, there was a case to be made that uh, Winona Ryder was definitely an inspiration of some sort for Tim Burton. I oh, mean, definitely. There's Probably definitely been other, there have been other ones who have since gone on to sort of take over that role, but I, I mean... Oh, she was the early pre... The pre-Helena Bottom Carter. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there, there's definitely something to be said for that. I mean, again, you know, this movie was nominated for Best Makeup at the Academy Awards. Stan Winston, always good. Oh, yeah. And um, unfortunately, in terms of acting, Johnny Depp was clearly the one who got all the attention Yes. Got Golden Globe nominations. And understandable. Stuff like that. I mean, you know, it's it's understandable. It's definitely a quirky character, but I mean, Winona Ryder had to sort of run an interesting gamut. I mean, she was sort of the one telling this in retrospect. Yes. She has to fall in love with a dude who has scissors <laughs> yes, for hands, yes. which is not the most easy uh -huh. uh, sort of love and interest playing, to go on. Playing with. the girl on both sides of the tracks is yes. such a cliche that yeah. it's it's. It's easy to fall into it not being believable. So totally. it, with someone like Renan Ryder, I think she, especially at this time, had enough heart to her acting to make it seem very viable that she both, you know, fit in her town sure. and also fell in love with this freak. Well, not well, only freak. that, but also you gotta give a shout out because Tim Burton wrote this one as well. Uh, yes. He wrote, directed, and produced it, which he did not do with Beetlejuice. Okay, that was Interesting. not written by him. So just directed. Yep. Okay. So, you know, this is really sort of like probably the one of the signature yes. creations of Tim Burton's career. And I hope I hope that, you know, when people think about Tim Burton and see sort of plummets to <laughs> earth like a comet these days. <laughs> though, I mean, I think freaking Weenie looks good. But nevertheless, like, it's been so long since I've cared about him. Yes. But this one always reminds me of why Tim Burton yes. is a talented guy. And why whenever it comes to him making something else gothic, we'll always fall for it again, because he did Batman and Edward Scissorhands, and between those two, it's like, come on, you gotta give the guy credit. He created a style, for oh, sure. Also interesting, considering Vincent Price played his master. Yes. Uh, not only Creator was this la uh, Vincent Price's last screen appearance, but his last scene he shot was his death scene. In cinema history, the last scene Vincent Price shot Feels in very cinema history is his own death scene, which is for for Vincent Price of all people, pretty pretty apt. Yeah, that is pretty apt. Moving in a very different direction, though. right into where I get in lots of arguments with people. All right, I'm looking forward to this because I don't like this movie at 1994, all. 1994, Reality Bites. This is the Ben Stiller directed um, story of a foursome of. Gen Xers? Yeah. Gen, Gen yeah. Xers? Yeah, we consider it Gen Xers. Um, who are sort of trying to adapt and live in the early 90s, and this is a time when, and like, AIDS... Love quadrangle. Are, yes. Quadrangle. Like, AIDS is coming mm -hmm. uh, into focus during this time period. Political correctness probably starting to yep, maybe TV make its rise. Yeah, TV is a very important thing. Mm -hmm. now, this is Alternative sort of, music scene definitely, definitely exploding up. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's it makes sense that... Ethan Hawke plays opposite Winona Ryder because yes. he was sort of another dude who was sort of quintessential for this kind of style. I mean, it's film takes place in Seattle. Yes, a lot uh, of the scenery is you can still find. Um, interestingly enough, what is it that you dislike about this movie? Let's start there. Well, I just I, okay. 
understandably, this goes wrong with a lot of people, so I can understand it being a bad foot to start. I saw this movie way after it was already loved and talked about being an amazing, wonderful 90s you know, capsule of the mm. alternative, like, you know, Gen X lifestyle type thing. Mm. And I watched it and I didn't care about really anything that was going on. I didn't care about much of the characters' interaction. And I really didn't like the what now would be qualified as hipster, kind of um, mm. proud, uh, I don't know, just snideness that the characters kind of t mm, uh, in their world they were all so sure of everything but they just couldn't get things right between each other mm. which I understand is a totally realistic thing and I'm not arguing that but it just never resonated with me in the same way that it did other people mm. at the time instead to me it struck much more of a false chord and I was very upset with with it I just ugh. You know, I, I mean, I'm not going to claim I love this movie. Like, it's okay. I think, for me, the thing that stands out most is it really feels like a time capsule. Oh, it's definitely me. a good not, Don't get me wrong. Not only a time capsule, but it's a film that was clearly, or not clearly, but ends up speaking to a very specific group of people. Yes. And only that group of people. Yes. It's not a wide audience Correct. kind of movie. And, you know, it's I, it's interesting to sort of see the arc of Ben Stiller's career as a director. I mean, mm. it's, it's definitely interesting. I think this is his first film. But, you know, he sent, went on to Cable Guy, Zoolander, and Tropic Thunder since then. So he's clearly, you know, grown more and more comfortable yes. in style. Obviously, this is early acting for yeah, him yeah. as well. So, I mean, he's definitely... Like a the disaster era. Yes. So it's, it's I mean, it's... It's definitely um, not the most um, creative story, but I think that there is something to be said about the chemistry between Winona Ryder and Ethan Hawke that okay. I think that they do seem like an appropriate sort of match and that you can understand how they could be confrontational and still yes. at the same time find an attraction to each yeah, other and I, I think that. I think that's what sort of engages me most in the movie you know Steve Zahn and Gene oh, yeah, Garofalo um, are nice there as well but it's really Winona Ryder and Ethan Hawke yeah. that really are all that interests me in this movie Steve Zahn was like I think Ben Stiller saw him at uh, do an improv act and then just hired him on for the role huh? also I find it interesting this kind of goes with my maybe my Maybe I just need to rewatch it. It's been a while. But my uh, distaste for the movie, uh, for a movie that has uh, quite an anti consumerist speech given by, I believe, uh, Winona Ryder's character. I don't remember her name. Was it uh, uh, Liana? Yes. Yes. Liana. Yeah. Um, she gives this big anti consumer speech at the beginning. But, but unfortunately, where reality bites was in film history was in an era where product placement was not so uh, not had not yet hit the bubble of people being angry against mm. it so the following amount of product pr pr placement and product references came up in the dialogue of the film gap bmw diet coke pringles big gulp pizza hut domino's evian camel straight cigarettes snickers mcdonald's whole foods continental airlines cocoa puffs and minute maid that's a lot yeah that's too much product placement i understand you want to make a movie real but that's too much product placement for a movie that Maybe has an anti-consumerist speech. Maybe that's the only way they could get it done. I, don't I know. know. And Ben Stiller also put a lot of work into trying to get the right kind of music for this movie, mm -hmm. and a lot of the changes he made involved um, get what songs he could and couldn't get rights to. Hmm. Interesting. Good, so, good you know, point. Some interesting. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, valid point. Valid concern. Uh, for a film that I'm more in the um, minority against. I don't know if it's minority. Maybe it's just the majority. Alien Resurrection. I'm this, probably more in the minority, to this, be honest. This is the... Uh, in that you like it? Yes. Th uh, this is the fourth chapter in the yes. Alien Saga. The post-Ripley death where she comes back as a robot or a cyborg or whatever you want to call her. Clone. Clone. Not a robot. Okay. Uh, human, alien, hybrid, clone. Yeah. Um... They just grow her like a uh, eighty or hundred years. I forget how yes, long. Yes, two hundred years yeah. after. Afterwards, yeah. Uh, you know, I this film obviously is the was it the um, the alien mutant birth thing with yes. the white alien. Yes. Which strangely uh, was voiced by a friend of mine's mom mixed with like a lion or something. Interesting. Yeah, I went over to his house. He had a bunch of alien resurrection stuff Swag. I was like, really big fan of that movie, huh? He was like, nah, my mom was the part gotcha. of the voice. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I just like 
my problem was I, f I had a lot of trouble caring in this movie. I like I just, I, I mean, it just never had that sort of like uh, click that the previous aliens had. Mm. Like it never really had sort of Sigourney Weaver feeling quite as like mm. in danger as Got the it. previous ones did. It never really felt like the threat was quite as ominous as the previous huh. ones. I, can, like it, I mean, it was, it was definitely much more, and I know you'll probably disagree with this. It was much more like aliens in the sense of it just being an action movie, not a thriller like uh, alien I can see that, yeah. or aliens three tried to be. Mm -hmm. Um, it's much more just about like, Oh, there's bad guys and we got to overcome them with superior guns. Um, it's interesting to note that you probably, uh, that's someone who agrees with you highly about the treatment of this movie is the writer, uh, mm. Joss Whedon. Yeah. Really. He really vehemently has opposed what ended up happening to this movie mm. because his script was, turned into a lot of things and he said well you know you in the end you you can't say that it's not your fault if you wrote it but he's like things were delivered not the way i wanted them written things were acted not the way i wanted them written the ending was done not the way i originally wrote it they changed the ending as well as other things the the hybrid looked different originally it was mu it was actually bigger than the queen than mm, they originally wanted and they tried to find the original queen and to the Destroyed. only way they could find it is they actually bought a fan replica because Whoa. they wasn't couldn't find an original and the best one they found was a fan replica wow that's crazy but, yeah. you know it's just like i i hear you about alien be more like aliens but mm. at the same time like I, f I understand the concept behind aliens like mm. aliens are like wow that was great i would love to see a whole bunch of those things and so sort of, they deliver that alien resurrection is just sort of like we're out of ideas. We're just going to like... And see, I felt the other way around. I was like, oh yeah, keep them coming. This is awesome. Look at all these different ways that they got like... They had a nice cast of characters, I felt. But like, then you're bringing like Ripley back. Like, it's sort of like... Well, you it have was, to in the Alien it was, series. That was nice when she died. Like, it was a good place to end that. I mean, they've gone on since to Alien vs. Predator, which has no Ripley in it at sure. all. I mean... Originally, the fourth film was supposed to be an Alien vs. Predator. Interesting. The thing that, I mean, I feel like it so, had so many good things going for it, I don't understand how it, it just ended up being so ho-hum to me. I mean, uh, the director... Jean-Pierre Jean 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 Jeunet. Yeah. Uh, he, I mean, he's one of the most interesting directors. He did Delicatessen, mm -hmm. City of Lost Children, yes. Amelie, Mick Max. Uh, as you said, uh, Joss Whedon was a writer, yes. Dan O'Bannon was involved with the characters in the, or, the original idea. Yeah. Um, you know, you have Sigourney Weaver back, you have Ron Perlman. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many good aspects to it it just it just doesn't feel like it it just kind of was there like it hmm. never it got yeah. no crit there's no critical acclaim for it surprisingly no razzie nominations i was surprised by i thought i, I think i think yeah and that's why i think i like it and you don't i think it does i will agree that it does ride that middle road and i think a uh, reading about it, I think a lot of that might have come from the fact, I mean, Jean-Pierre Junet didn't speak a word of English and had to have a translator yeah, on set. It was help. the first movie he did without uh, like Mark Caro or whatever the other gentleman's mm. name that he co-directed Delicatessen and City of Lost Children mm -hmm. with. So that guy didn't want anything to do with the alien world, so he had to do it. And, and it's like if you have a, a script that the script writer feels was taken way out of context and yeah. a director who can't speak the native language that you're working with is it surprising that a disconnect happened? Especially a fourth movie in a franchise no, that's so totally. beloved. But it's sort of like so sad after all the, the shit oh, yeah. part three got. That oh, yeah. they were so like lazy and putting together part four. Hmm. That it's that's just how you feel it was? Interesting. I don't know. Maybe lazy's too harsh. But just like that they just didn't really go all out in trying to make it mm. awesome. It just feels like they kind of threw a bunch of different parts together and didn't really see about making them cohesively come together. Hmm. Interesting. For, for You think about how big Alien 1 and 2 are, yeah like neither of three or four is like oh no in that conversation no, no, it's no, almost no. like a completely and different see, series i'm not surprised though that that knee jerk after what happened with three made them return to what they did with four because even though even though four tries to be different it is in a spaceship again it is you know the aliens are on the ship and that's the threat again you do have like you know the, there's a, some bigger nefarious plot with the aliens that they're trying to figure out so it, it did definitely return more to the like Marines against alien yeah. than it did like let's put some convicts on a random planet with some things in the vents. But like, for it me, it was a whole different try to element. I but for so. me, like it was not the same Sigourney Weaver, and that just sort of set a bad taste in my mouth, so to speak. Well, it was supposed to be right? So, but it just, and that, and, and I mean, that was that, too much for you. you but know? I mean, that's not the alien I want. Like mm. I, that's why I don't really care about alien versus predators because yeah, I, I like them for Ripley, not for like 
the alien. I don't know if you remember, there's the part in the movie where Sigourney Weaver hucks the basketball over her head yes, and makes that. I she do. actually oh, yeah. made that shot. Wow. That take, in fact, is they, they were trying it and it wasn't working and it, she could get it sometimes, but never good enough. And the director just wanted to have her throw it off camera and drop in. And she's like, no, 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 let me try it one more time. And did it and got it on the first take was so so fast that Ron Perlman broke character and turned around and faced the camera was like, oh my God, like got shocked. And they were, everybody got freaked out. Cause they were like, oh God, did we just ruin that take? And the editor looked at it and was like, nope, I think we can Work cut it, it. That's awesome. appropriately. Also going with the theme of death. Cause I gotta, cause it just seems very weirdly connected to Winona Ryder's career. Um, the underwater sequence marked the first time that Winona Ryder had been underwater since she almost drowned when she was 12. Wow. And the moment she went underwater, she had a panic attack, panic attack and almost died. Wow. As did Ron Perlman. He hit his head on something and almost drowned. That's crazy. That was crazy. <laughs> that whole underwater scene that almost killed like half the actors, it seems. That would not have gone well for that insurance company, let me tell you. Let's move forward to mm -hmm. perhaps one of the, again, tentpole films of her career. Not necessarily because of her, but Girl Interrupted. Yes. Um, this is the Angelina Jolie breakout performance about a group of... Breakout? Yeah. Totally. Mm. Uh, this is the the story about a group of young ladies. Maybe first in, commercial success, but I wouldn't. I don't think it's I a think breakout. It's breakout. <laughs> um, I would say that critically, at least. Um, group of young women in asylum who yes. sort of become friends, and uh, you know, it's like the big show in an asylum or something. <laughs> <laughs> or the Great Escape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that too. But instead of uh, World War Two uh, vets or it's mental, soldiers, it's uh, mental uh, patients. Yeah, <laughs> mental, mental problems. <laughs> and you know, it's a story of like a group of women who all bond over their shared problems, so to speak, and sort of begin to, to understand to each other and understand themselves through the experience. Hmm. Um, I, I mean, I definitely think Angelina Jolie definitely separated herself. I mean, obviously, she's a very attractive woman, you know. She went on to do Tomb Raiders and whatnot. She oh, might yes. have even done one or two at that point. So she definitely had the sex appeal going for her. But this is the point at which she really sort of proved that she could act. Mm. Like, she really, really blew people away with this performance. So much so that, like, if you look at the, the acting nominations for this... Mm -hmm. Winona Ryder is not is like almost entirely forgotten. It's all right. Angelina Jolie. Like happens the, to narrators. The only one I think I could find was she was nominated for favorite actress for a blockbuster award. Hmm. If it tells you how like deep I have to struggle to find something for her. Whereas no Teen Choice Awards. No, sadly. Um, I, believe me, I'll take them if I could get them. I know you will. Uh, whereas Winona, or sorry, uh, Angelina Jolie. Um, won obviously the Academy Award for supporting. She won the Blockbuster Award for supporting. I mean, she was all over the map following this movie. And, you know... And part of that is how, you know, incredibly rude and cruel and separated she is emotionally from any of the other characters. Yeah, I mean, she definitely... Uh, I mean, I, she steals the scenes, though. Her character is so oh, commanding I'm not saying she's not, but when you have a character that you dislike, especially a character who's being mean to a ma your main narrator, narrator, it's easy for it to be more an interesting well, character. I don't know if I would necessarily say it's just because she's mean. I think it's one of these things that you just sort of, like, she's so complicated. Some of the time mm. she's so harsh. Some of the time she's nice. Like, you just don't understand what's going on with they her. They are I crazy think, people in the loony bin. Yeah, and I think that makes it compelling. Whereas, why not a writer, I mean all compared to the other people there is fairly fairly sane i mean yeah well, she but she also she occupies i i feel the role that um tim robbins occupies in shawshank she is the one who's not necessarily i mean yes she has problems but she's not supposed to be there in the same way that the other people are supposed to be there the girl commits suicide and uh mm -hmm. you know angelina jolie's character and it's not I'm not saying that in, that one on a writer's character isn't also troubled, but in the same in a way where she, it's kind of almost a fish out of water story. It's her adjusting to this new thing. You know, I, I'll, I'll I'll sort of spin you a different perspective. I think one of the reasons why why Nona Ryder didn't get enough credit for this performance is because. In a film all about crazy people, yes. she was the most forgettable of it. Yes, because she's mean, trying to be the most... You think about, like, was it Brittany Murphy was yes. in this? You have Elizabeth Moss mm -hmm. before Mad That's Men, right. which is yeah. crazy. Like, there were so many crazy scenes, like, you know, with the, the turkey dinners yeah. under the bed and stuff like that. Like, there's so many <laughs> the signature... Hoarder. Yeah, so many signature moments like that that, you know, she just really 
kind of seems vanilla by mm. comparison. And because of that, it's sort of like you focus on the people who draw your attention, mm. where she's sort of like the the tan background. Sometimes there. you need a tan background for colors well, to look bright against. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. But that doesn't necessarily get her the attention oh, yeah, of I, this. Definitely. And so I she's she's sort of like, sadly, the forgotten Cran in the box mm -hmm. because of that, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think I think she was very good. Mm -hmm. I think she plays the role very very solidly. Um, but you know, but yeah, yeah. Clearly, Angelina Jolie is the is the uh, brightest moment of the film, without doubt. And it's sort of interesting again, you know, talking about another uh, director that sort of made his way in Hollywood, um, just sort of chugging along. Okay, James Mangold has directed Copland. Okay, Kate and Leopold. The uh, uh, -huh. line, uh yeah. was it the Meg Hugh Ryan, Jackman. Hugh Jackman, love one, uh, Identity, uh -huh. John Cusick, yeah. uh, Thrower, uh -huh. Walk the Line, the okay, yeah, the John Ca Johnny Cash uh, biopic, yep, biopic, Three Ten to Yuma, Christian Bale, okay. Russell Crowe, Night and Day, Tom Cruise oh, movie, and that. now directing The Wolverine, starring Hugh Jackman. Uh, he's the one who's currently attached to it? Yep. Yeah. So, just chugging away. Jeez. Um, it was funny, when we were talking about doing Winona Ryder, it, it occurred to me that this was sort of like the last real pop that I could think of for... She got caught stealing well, after it's not, it's not just that. She, she <laughs> was. Know. She was caught shoplifting in 2001. But even beyond that, following that, she took a hiatus from acting. Until uh, 2005, right. she like focus on being a mother or something, or I don't I, remember what. I don't. I'm not entirely sure what she did it for. I mean, mm. I, I'm not going to speculate. Yeah. But she she stopped acting from gotcha. 2001 to 2005, hmm. which for a, a woman for in someone, her position yeah. <laughs> is I don't, I'm, I'm not going to say career suicide. Yeah. But it's really going to take a blow to your career because yes. at the end of the 90s, I think in 2000, she got a Hollywood star oh wow like she was that big at that point and so deservedly so deservedly so but you know a first the uh shoplifting yes. arrest <laughs> really sort of painted a very bizarre picture of her and maybe she does have mental problems i'm not going to say maybe she is a kleptomaniac or something but then beyond that she leaves that as the lasting impression yeah. in people <laughs> It is a movie mean, about crazy. Well, not, Do something okay. crazy. One, one from slight acting. correction. There were two films that of hers that came out after 2001 that she okay. had filmed before then. Mr. Deeds with Adam oh, Sandler uh -huh. and Simone with Al Pacino. Oh, yes. So those are the other two lasting impressions. <laughs> so shoplifting, Mr. Deeds, Simone, <laughs> four year hiatus. Like, I, can, I, can, I can understand after Simone, I might take a four year hiatus. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, but that's like, that is like, that, that's the exact opposite. After Simone, you should be like fucking working your ass off because <laughs> yes. you don't want to leave that that's, in people's mouths. That's mind. a good and point. And so that's yeah, what she that's left in people's mouths. Much better and idea. Like, I, I mean, I, it may, I understandably makes sense that it's she hasn't been instantly able to revive the career because mm -hmm. not only did she sort of destroy her career in some ways, <laughs> but she's also getting older, and women in Hollywood are marginalized for sure yes. as they get older. So it definitely played a huge part in her disappearing essentially in a lot of ways. I mean, A Scanner Darkly was the first yeah. time she came back oh, with wow. after that. Yeah. So, And it's also crazy to think, you know, so we'll be passing by it, but to think that I think for the first time that I can remember she in Star Trek, she played a purposely oh, older woman. Mother. Like, yeah. Not only a mother, but a mother with mother of like a full adult who had gray and like I mean yeah, she went that old. was uh I remember that being a very shocking after Scanner Darkly where she's still trying to play young and love. Well, I think just... I mean I think this is appropriate because the next one we're gonna talk about is Black Swan, two thousand ten, mm -hmm. supporting role for that film, but she plays the, <laughs> the fallen star essentially. The fallen the star, yeah. The, that's starlet. being pushed out and there's a lot of things to like about that movie, yes. and you know, Natalie Portman's great, Neil Kunis is great, mm -hmm. Vincent Castle's great, but Winona Ryder is so disturbing as the aging star, and you know, when she speaks about how you're going to get pushed to the side uh -huh. and be worthless, so passionate. It's it's so chilling, and you know, it's probably because she's really speaking from her heart. I yeah, mean, it, this is something she's gone through, and it's just it is chilling to see her when she's on screen. She's only on screen for like 20 minutes or something. Yeah, but considering she's... how dark Darren Aronofsky is upstairs, I wouldn't be surprised if he had to sit down with her at some point. Total speculation, being like. You know, you know your dark place. 
Let's go there. Let's bring that I, dark I mean, place I, out. I'll, I'll even take it a step further, and I wonder if he cast her because of that. I would because be it's sort of like, oh, she's a washed up actress. Like, let's we need someone just like that. I for hope he this. didn't use those words. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't use that when he was casting her. But at the I like same it. casting call, looking for washed up white lady. At the same at the at the same time, you know, beggars can't be choosers. That's let's true. be let's be honest. That's so true. you know, Black Swan, fantastic film, but mm -hmm. Winona Ryder absolutely blew me yes. away with that yes. role, and I I think she deserved at least a nomination for supporting actress sadly she did not get that i mean the film won for nally portman for yes. best actress i could have easily have seen uh winona ryder gain a nomination there as well uh, portman lost like 40 pounds or something for this role which is crazy because where would she lose 40 pounds like it's just like yeah her and oh. her and winona ryder together yeah, are such a powerful combination that film is just and, you know that movie's full of twisted interesting things you know the, it being the wrestler and yes. black swan originally being one movie uh, something i found interesting considering i've actually seen this and the extent that darren aronofsky went to just achieve this one single shot is the overhead shot of Nina in the bathroom where mm -hmm. she puts herself underwater and then she sees the person and she sure. freaks out. That's an exact shot, uh, exact replica of a shot in a Japanese anime, hmm. Perfect Blue, by uh, director Satoshi Kon, who I love. And it's a incredibly twisted film. And the, th the thing that's so interesting about that is that prior to Requiem for a Dream, so like what we're talking... When, was, when did Black Swan come 2010. out? 2010. So we're talking probably 15 years, or, or at least wow. 12 to 15 years prior. Darren Aronofsky bought the remake rights to that film mm. so that he could do that, so that he could recreate that shot. Wow. That's I mean, kind of cool. He, 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 he's definitely in that category with people like Wes Anderson and Paul Thomas Anderson who are so acute in every detail of their films yes. that, you know, it's just, it really is a powerful yes. thing. And that movie's great. Also, it's interesting to note how much there's a mirror or a reflective surface in almost every single shot in that movie. Hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. With the mm -hmm. concept. Brings us Thematically to this... makes sense. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Brings us to this Friday, though, October 5th. We're talking Frank and Weenie. Mm -hmm. This is the Tim Burton film, as you said, book ending yes. the uh, segment. Also, with, you know, obviously, why not writer early Tim Burton? Why not writer early Tim Burton that's coming back around? Well, not so. only that, but also Tim Burton did a short yes. Frank and Weenie yeah. back in 1994. That's what I mean by coming back around. Because this was his first work, I think. Yeah, was. his first uh, pre Pee Wee's Big Adventure, yes. sort of the one that I think circulated at the studio or whatever, mm -hmm. got my attention. Uh, story of a uh, young Victor conducts a science experiment to bring his beloved dog Sparky back to life, <laughs> only to face unintended, sometimes monstrous consequences. Mm -hmm. Sort of sounds like Pet Cemetery, but have you seen the original short? Uh, oh, it's great. It's very. But yeah. from from everything I've seen, it's essentially like a light-hearted version of Pet Cemetery. Yes. It's uh, it's, it's actually really sweet... interesting because from what I remember of the original short, it's like he brings his dog back to from the dead and it acts completely like a normal dog mm -hmm. but has like crazy bolts in its neck mm -hmm. and is sh like when people get too close to it it'll it's so charged with electricity and only the boy isn't affected mm -hmm. i think it kills people just being around it so there's all these horrible accidents going around this little boy regaining their lost best friend yeah i mean it just it looks sweet from the trailer i definitely am looking forward to it i i hope you know i hope she gets uh some good play out of mm -hmm. this i mean it's got classic tim burton people in yeah at martin landau christopher lee Catherine o'hara so I'm definitely optimistic about it. You know, um, this is a throwback to sort of that classic Tim Burton that I know and love. I hope he goes back to more stuff like this and stops trying to do crazy uh, book remakes. Well, not just that, but just like trying to like take on every pop culture icon yes. and doing and, that and sort of stuff. Make and make Johnny Depp it again. Right, exactly. Just do more <laughs> of his quirky creative ideas. Yeah. Those are the ones that he really thrives. More doing. big fish and Edward Scissorhands, less Alice in Wonderland and Corpse Bride. That's or my shock or uh, Charlie and the Chocolate yeah. Factor too. Yeah. So cool. um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm Stickers. definitely gonna be checking it out. It does um, look interesting. Let us know your feedback about that and join us next time for a DVD rundown for the week of October 9th. Whew. Flying by. As always, you can find us at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes, Blip, Roku, Miro. Check in and get glue and we'll in three see. dimensions. <laughs> we will see you next time <laughs> in two dimensions. Oh.